Hey fam, how's it going? Welcome back to my channel, and uh, if you are new here, hello, my name's Amy. It's nice to meet ya. Um, this week we're gonna start off with horror, and then we're gonna move on and transition over to Bizarro, because I've been playing the fuck out over in that genre. Um, and then, you know, uh, yap about some other shit. Either way, I'm gonna babble, I'm gonna digress, because that's, that's, that's what I do here. You've been warned. <laughs> curiouser and curiouser. Okay, first of all, I should warn you, if you're new here, I should warn you, I'm finicky about spoilers. Even just simple as shit that someone will mention, I'm like, oh, kind of wish I didn't know that. But, but like, that's me. Um, but I also, like, it's easy to get carried away when you're yapping, you know what I mean? So I'm gonna try at least, at the very least, in editing to provide timestamps and all that groovy shit, okay? Um, yeah, so. Here we go. The first story, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this shit. This is my jam. If you've been here, you know I love this shit. Mexican Gothic. I almost dropped this shit. <laughs> Freaking Mexican Gothic. <laughs> so when I first began hearing about this book, when it first came out and everyone was reviewing it and shit, when I hear things that I like about a book or if I'm watching someone play a game on Twitch or something and I like what I'm seeing or hearing, then I'm going to hit a point where I'm like, la, 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 and I just tune out. I'm usually reading a book while I'm going through, um, catching up on booktube videos and shit because once I hear after a point, like I don't fucking want to hear anything anybody else has to say until after I've read it because you wooed me. Okay. You did that. Um, so since reading this, more people have, I've been watching more people review it, and a lot of people have called it a slow burn. I normally don't like slow burns, and so when I heard someone describe it as a slow burn, I was like, oh, it is, isn't it? I'm just such a sucker for this kind of, for the gothic shit. And as a matter of fact, when I was finishing reading this, I realized I don't have anything else. I'm all, I'm like, I'm all caught up on my gothic shit. Oh no. And I actually, you're not gonna believe it. I ordered Rebecca. <laughs> I feel like my entire life I've been wanting to read Daphne shit or this shit, you know? And <laughs> I don't know how I made it this far. So that made me feel better. But then I realized, oh, I do have something and I'll get to that one later. So I had a bridge to kind of see me through. Anyway, um, so I guess this was a good way for me to realize about myself that, yeah, I do. It just depends on how the slow burn goes, <laughs> I guess. And like, is there like, is it described as a Victorian manor? I think it is like right from the get go. And I was like, Ooh, fog. Ooh, freaking cousin talking about ghosts and shit. Ooh. So like, I love this shit. I'm um, maybe I'm just biased as fuck. Know that I might be a bit biased as fuck about this shit. <laughs> and uh, I'm just gonna blame VC Andrews. I read so much VC Andrews in high school. My favorite is my sweet Audrina, the one standing alone. <laughs> so you would think that throughout my life I would have already known a long time ago that that's my shit. That's one of my jams. But no, I just realized when I was panicking. <laughs> so not leaving myself without something like that to read ever again. Moving on. <laughs> so anyway, I love this story. I fucking love this story. Enough to where I feel like that's all I can say. Really, everybody else has been, you know, you've heard a lot about this story, haven't you? <laughs> I went to later. Oop, shit. Oh, oh no. Okay, so for me, this is the first of the hard case crime books of his that I've read. Not because I was like, fuck that, but more just like, I'll get to it. I still intend on getting to it, okay? Um, but the things I was hearing about this one, really like, I couldn't wait. I, I, need, I needed it. I wanted to get this over and done with. And I was really tired of skipping everybody's shit. So um, if you are a someone, like a fan who's read quite a bit, then it'll be, it can be like Pee Wee's Playhouse. You know what I mean? And there is this particular word starts with the D. So every time you see this D word, 
in the book, you gotta lose your fucking mind. All right. And that's what a lot of these are. The other ones are probably me going beep, beep, Steven. Oh shit. That's what I get. That's what I get for getting cocky. Um, because there's a lot of repetition and not, not the one that you might, if you read it, not the one you might, but you know what I mean? Like, um, how many times are you going to fucking tell us it's a goddamn horror story? Which brings us to what I really want to discuss with you guys. Um, and that is the like, what? Fuck genre. That's the topic of this particular discussion. <laughs> and I feel like this is a really good example of that because like, do you, th like, what do you think he does? Do you think he sits there and goes, okay, no, this one, this one's going to be horror as fuck. And that one, oh no, 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 no. Hard case. And shit like... Or do you think it's like, meh, you know, I don't know. Is it planned? You know what I mean? Like, what is the deal with that? Because ultimately you're going to hear over and over. I told you this horror story. Um, like when I'm writing, like my heart and sore may be in horror, but at the same time, it's like my perceived good story when it comes to what I want to read, right? It's usually horror. So it's whatever. Um, and this one, like I said, I feel like, like, it could be either or, really, because it's Stephen King. Do you know what I mean? Like, him and Koontz, when I ran the horror section at that store, were like my fluffer guys. You know what I mean? Say it. Saying, know what I'm saying, too many times. 80, 90 times. That's too many times. Once or twice is cool, but 80 or 90 times, man? What, are you from the department of Noam Sands? You taking no, the Noam Census? You counting my Noam Horror Sands? doesn't get as much love in a used bookstore as other genres do, like mystery and shit, um, which is really silly. And that's why I haven't done the horror tube tag thing because there's that question about like, what's wrong with you or whatever. Like, you know what, fuck those people because aren't we all reading about people dying and shit? Mystery, thriller, horror. I feel like us horror fans are just more comfortable in that darkness. We're more comfortable with it all. And we got really fucking good survival skills. Thank you. You know what I mean? Whereas the mainstreamers and the mystery thrillers, no offense, because I dig that shit too. Like we're all reading, like Patricia Cornwell, she was a medical, she really was a medical examiner. That bitch gets really fucking graphic in that shit. <laughs> like, damn, I'm reading that shit with my mom. <laughs> so I feel like that's a good example of fuck genres. Let's bend that shit. Let's write like... Do you want a story? Have I got a story for you? That's all he's doing with that. Um, and I put that shit away before I read the synopsis, didn't I? Sometimes growing up means facing your demons. Uh, the son of a struggling single mother, Jamie Conklin, just wants an ordinary childhood. But Jamie is no ordinary child. Born with an unnatural ability, his mom urges him to keep secret. Jamie can see what no one else can see and learn what no one else can learn. But the cost of using my voice, I fucked it up last week, my voice. But the cost of using this ability is higher than Jamie can imagine. As he discovers when an NYPD detective draws him into the pursuit of a killer who has threatened to strike from beyond the grave. My favorite Stephen King story is Lisey's story. And I'm really excited to, uh, I'm excited and yet I'm also like please please <laughs> please <laughs> please go on to Zibrizaro. Um I'll talk about this one since it's the longest one. This is a collection of stories um by Jeremy Robert Johnson. Um So this book has contents and it's laid out a very specific way i don't want to like take that shit away from you but it's particular uh collections and then stuff that follows and one of the things that follows is the full unabridged version of one of those short stories and the only reason i'm saying that and not just letting you experience that on your own is i fucking wish i'd known that from the first like right from the i wish someone had told that to me like yo Life's too short, just read this one. While it may be interesting to see what's chosen to pare it down to and then see like what it's like unleashed or whatever, but like, I don't know, that 
dude. I wish I could have like read that first. Jeez. Anyway, <laughs> my favorite story from here is called Cathedral Mother, but I'm also biased as fuck because that's like up in the trees in the Pacific Northwest, you know, like up in those tall ass fucking redwoods and shit and just is a good one. I have so many like this, th these stories, motherfucker, like, like if you're into Bizarro, if you're into some shit, yeah, sure. There's one point where I was like, I don't know if you're trying to trigger me as a woman on purpose or not. God, I wish I could remember what name that one is. One of my general notes is apparently this writer will sucker punch your feels at times. Maybe that's why I don't remember very much. I repressed that shit. <laughs> but also, like, um, it's still Bizarro. And one of my favorite things about Bizarro is, like, especially with, like, books like this. We have Tongue or Teeth and Tongue Landscape by Carlton. Yep, Carlton Malik III. And then we have Winnie by Katie Michelle Quinn. They're so small, right? They're so small. And yet you'll be at a point with these books where you're, like, where the fuck else can you go? Like, where the fuck, where the fuck? But you still have like 50 pages left and you're like, what the fuck? What, where else, what kind of, I have this phrase, it sounds really bad. It sounds really, really bad. So please bear with me. Um, but it's, you know, like you're watching anime, right? Say you're new to anime and you're like, what the fuck is that character a talking bear? What the hell? Don't worry about it. Just, just, just enjoy the story, okay? Just enjoy the story. Who gives a fuck, all right? Just, 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 just. What is that reindeer doing? And why is he healing people? That is Chopper, you will respect, and just give in like it's anime, folks. Just, just, just give in. Why are you asking so many questions? We're on an adventure. Like, we're, we're going places. Don't worry about what's coming next. Don't worry about these freaking talking animals. These freaking drink the horn juice, okay? It's okay. <laughs> it's like that's bizarro. Just just give in. Stop asking questions. Grab your ankles. Give in. Sometimes it's okay with consent, all right? You need consent. <laughs> I did not like uh, We Live Inside You as much as some, but I do think it's still worth a read. And, you know, that's just my opinion. And it's probably because of that one fucking story where I'm like, what's your deal with women, Jeremy? Um, but that could also just be my own problem. <laughs> Next, we're gonna go into Winnie because I fucking love this story. It was introduced to me as a trans bizarro novel and I was like, okay, Winnie and Colt forever. Winnie is Colt's one and only. Colt is Winnie's true love. Winnie is Colt's rifle. And there is nothing Winnie wants more than to please Colt. And since a rifle is everything the young cowboys ever wanted, she certainly does that. But one day, Winnie finds that she is not a rifle, but in fact a woman. Can Winnie keep the sparks between them ignited, even if it isn't the gun, even if she isn't the gun of his dreams? What happens if she can't? <sighs> Seriously, oh my goodness. I experienced so many emotions reading this story. Katie is a queer trans woman living in Seattle. Fuck yeah, you are. Fuck yeah, Katie. Um, queer is a Katie, Seattle woman living in trans. Woman is a living Seattle Katie, trans and queer. She likes cats. <sighs> this book is, this story is so good. I love this story. Let's, I don't even know, like, there's only so much that I can say. It's so short that... I'd be spoiling. I don't, I don't want to spoil anything. That's the main thing, you know? I don't want to spoil anything for you. So let's see what... Let me... Let me let, let's go. First page. Because you need to... You, you need to know. I can't not let you know. Colt tells me I am the only girl he'll ever want. The only one he'll ever need. He takes me out to pasture to fix a tear in the fence put there by cougars or dogs or fucking drunk teenagers again driving past the lyrics of some awful pop country song, Fiddle Fast. That song plays on the radio of Colt's own old Ford K1 
can in the cup holder, driving down dirt. But he's no teenager, and he knows how to hold a cord slow enough that the few cops around won't see it. And that makes all the difference. Mm hmm He takes me into the forest to kill dinner, pray for deer. But more often than not, it's just a squirrel and sometimes nothing at all. I don't eat, but I always pray for deer. That way, when Colt holds me close, hands wrapping me tight, whispering, you got this girl, you got this Winnie. Come on now, just right through the skull and done. And I aim, breathless, and let the round fly straight and true as God in America. Colt will be smiling when he drags it home. The deer falls flat and he dances around and yips like a young imitation of the cowboy he is. He'll squeeze me to his chest and stroke me gently and say, good girl, I knew you could do it. And everyone's happy and the well-fed sun sets kaleidoscopically over the quiet Rockies. He'll lay me down on the ragged spent bench seat of his Ford, then climb into the cab himself and mutter it awake. The radio plays a Toby Keith song and Colt sings to it in a voice that's a new nickel covered in mud. We drive into town, ghost town, the place he lives outside of, which is to say we drive to the gas station on the outskirts of it. Another carton of Marlboro and a couple 318 racks of cores to make it till Sunday. 10 minutes in and we're growling down the road back home, shuddering over bumps. When we pull in home, Colt shuts off the truck and inhales one more whiff of its musk, finishing up his cores for the ditch and tells me that I am the only girl he'll ever want, the only one he'll need. I know this to be true. He tells me every night. After the fences have been fixed, dinner's been killed and cooked, and the drinks and darts have been slurped and smoked, he tells me this. Seriously, the flow, the fucking, ugh. That is just the first page, fam. That's just the first page. Like, seriously. Winnie, Katie Michelle Quinn, Fuck yeah. five stars. I read that and this in one day. And that one, just like, <sighs> there's a point where I had to kind of set it down for just a moment, mainly because I just wanted to, you know, because like, Katie was trying to make me cry. Everything makes me cry. Everything. <clears throat> So, you know, like get some food, come back, get right the fuck back to it. <laughs> now, this is my second Carlton Mellick the third book or that I've read. The first one was A Haunted Vagina. I love that book. I was that was my first Bizarro novel. Novel story that I ever read. And it was just that's what the experience was like for me. Where the fuck can we possibly go from here? What the fuck? What? Wait, who the fuck? What? Huh? Okay. <laughs> so we were on good terms. And then I started reading this, and I really want to know, who do I turn in my complaint for the mishandling of a metal woman to? Who do, I, who do I turn in that complaint to? Because what the fuck? Like, okay, so thankfully this is one of those author's notes in the beginning of the story that doesn't fucking spoil shit for you. Right off the bat, he says, I don't remember writing this book at all. <laughs> One day I found it on my computer, buried in the dozens of unpublished novels I have molding there. I probably wrote it during a drinking slash writing binge. And then he goes on in terms of like, who hurt you, Carlton? Who do like, is this the character that he just takes out all of his shit with chicks? Just she doesn't even talk, she clicks at him. You know, like clucking like a hen. Let me see if I can find an example. Here we go. And metal woman drips oily tears at me for not paying very close attention to her at all times. That, okay guy, first and foremost, it's a fucking conversation, all right? Communication, that's all. Should probably read the synopsis to you, huh? In a world made of meat. Meat. A socially obsessive, monophobic man finds himself to be the last human being on the face of the planet. Desperate for social interaction, he explores the landscape of flesh and blood, teeth 
and tongue, trying to befriend any strange creature or community that he comes across. And that's like literally where I want to leave it at because I don't, I don't like, I just, I just, who do I complain to for the mishandling of Metal Woman? And even and the only reason I'm comfortable saying that is because even, it's bizarro. Where the fuck, where the, where the fuck, where the, don't worry. <laughs> don't fucking worry. I don't think, I don't think I've actually spoiled anything. It's like, I'm trying, I'm just, I've been trying to stick to my feelings and stuff. That's just safer. Okay, so moving on. Then we have our honorable mentions. Like Young and Clark's In Order to Live. This was a borrowed book. Um, I spent so much time being petrified of fucking up this white fucking cover. <gasps> mm. So uh, a while ago I began learning Korean. I want to learn all of the languages. I took French in high school. Now I'm learning Korean. I wish I'd learned uh, Spanish in high school because I would have probably used it. I've done so much customer service and that's the only language I've ever been like, motherfucker, why? Why didn't I do that? I could have learned French later. Anytime I want to learn a new language, I gotta like, you know, I want to immerse in the culture. I love that shit. There's a big old world out there and I want to see it. Um, so that is the good, bad and the ugly. You know what I mean? And uh, so this is her, um, it starts off with, I am most grateful, this is a quote, for two things, that I was born in North Korea and that I escaped from North Korea, end quote. Still in her early 20s, Yunmi Park has lived through experiences that few women of any age will ever know and from which most would never recover. At age 13, together with her mother, she made a harrowing ex escape from a brutal, from brutal conditions in North Korea. Two years later, they reached South Korea and freedom, but the devastating journey in between cost Park her childhood and nearly her life. And she, as she writes, quote, I convinced myself that a lot of what I had experienced never happened. I taught myself to forget the rest, end quote. In In Order to Live, Park shines a light not just into the darkest corners of life in North Korea, describing the deprivation and deception she endured and that millions of North Korean people continue to endure to this day, but also onto her own most painful and difficult memories. She tells with bravery and dignity for the first time the story of how she and her mother were betrayed. Trigger warning. Here it is. And sold into sexual slavery in China and forced to suffer terrible psychological and physical hardship. Park confronts her past with a startling resilience. And I agree. In spite of everything, she has never stopped being proud of where she is from and never stopped striving for a better life. Today, she is a human rights activist working determinedly to bring attention to the oppression taking place in her home country. Park's testimony is rare, edifying, and terribly important, and the story she tells in An Order to Live is heartbreaking and unimaginable, but never without hope. I agree with all of that. Um, this is a very difficult read at times, especially if you read it after a book like Kindred by Octavia E. Butler, What Was I Thinking? My Soul has been crushed so fucking much, so fucking much. And I still just want to read about people living their lives. <laughs> I am really bad about like some of my follow-up books. Like sometimes it's like, man, I just want to get away from these tropes or this particular whatever. And I'm just right back in it with that next book fan. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of serious shit going on in this. Um, but if, you know, you can, handle that when <laughs> you have a responsible adult someone to hug whatever the heck then i read honey girl and i'm so fucking thankful that i read honey girl i needed this <laughs> oh my god 
So like, uh, I feel very rude with this story because she is an astronomer, hello, with her newly completed PhD in astronomy, fuck yes, in hand, Grace Porter goes on a girl's trip to Vegas to celebrate. She's a straight A, hardworking, high achiever. We love a Gilmore around here. Not a Gilmore. We love a Rory around here. <laughs> um, although really that character was kind of a fucking spoiled brat, wasn't she? She is not the kind of person who goes to Vegas and gets drunkenly married to a woman whose name she doesn't know. Until she does exactly that. <laughs> this one beautiful, spontaneous moment upends Grace's carefully laid life plans. Staggering under the weight of her parents' expectations, a struggling job market, and feelings of burnout, Grace flees her home in Portland, Oregon, um, for a summer in New York with a wife she barely knows. In New York, she's able to ignore all the constant questions about her future and falls hard for her creative and gorgeous wife, Yuki Yamamoto. But when reality comes crashing in, Grace must face that she's been running from what she's been running from all along. The fears that make us human and the need for connection, especially when navigating the messiness of adulthood. Word. I kind of wish that they didn't go as deep as they did in that synopsis. Um, what's my note here? <laughs> Wound up identifying with it way more with main character that's what that is way more than i planned on emotionally investing um especially after something like Annie the roof fuck rent a two bedroom with a shitty balcony and an ugly cactus like what did that fucking cactus do to you it's basically full of a lot of human humanity a lot of those moments that like this was a good like chill out need to like wind down and pass the fuck out soon story um and astronomy all right have you watched the haunted series on netflix yet because oh i love that shit i fucking love that shit the freaking latin america one has been added on so if you've been eyeballing it and you haven't read it or we're moving on to a show Amy. um you should check it out you should check it out I've been trying to remember and I keep forgetting to freaking look at it and I'm filming on my phone. So, um, I'm going to completely change my setup here next time. So here's to hope I don't fuck that shit up. I can't remember if it was haunted or if it was another show. Cause a couple of them came out around the same time as that first season of haunted. Right. And the other one wasn't necessarily about hauntings and shit scaryish but like real real stories it was very much so a nah like you gotta you know decide which one like that one might have actually happened but this bitch is lying that kind of shit mainly because there was one was it the final story in that season in like upstate new york like up in the boonies but wasn't it was like in the 70s or something like that and whew, there's a, like no no, no fucking way. There's no way. I even Googled it. There's no, like, I'm not the only one thinking this. Do you, have you watched it? Do you think that shit was true? Mm. I, cause I think one of the things that enables it is back then, like if you're in a city along the coast here, at least here in America, cause that's what I can speak of. Um, it feels a little crowded, <laughs> you know what I mean? Especially these days. But to think of like one of my main complaints with a city like Seattle um, is like, oh, I miss it when I was a kid. There just wasn't so many people, you know what I mean? It was so chill. And now it's just, we don't have roads, it's just parking lots. <laughs> and um, it's like, I remembered that. So New York is probably the same way. And if this was back in the 70s, I don't know. You could get like another enabling thing, just fucking DNA shit and fingerprinting. Like it was all like whatever for investigators was a thing. It was such, it's such infancy of it's like, ugh, just <sighs> that is cold as fuck. I think that's one where it's been embellished 
but I've really, the Latin American one is, is really fucking, it's really fucking good. There's even a fucking doll episode. Oh yeah. And also the episodes aren't that long. They're like 20 to 30 minutes. So, and there's like maybe six. It's one of those shows you can really binge through. So seriously, if you haven't given it a chance yet, what the what? Huh? The artist spotlight for this week is Amanda Todd Illustrations. So we met originally on Twitch. Uh, and she used the name Lady Ghoul. Like, had these holographic stickers. Fucking cool. I love her art style. And there's this one. Hopefully, those are showing up okay without stupid fucking room. Um, she's a great artist. All kinds of stuff on her Etsy shop. She updates it regularly. Fan. and she is around on socials there's something else she does but i'm not gonna tell you about that because that is like you know she's on a team and shit this is her shit you know what i mean um and this is also her pin that i've had up there um i'm trying i have a hat that has a lot of pins on them hopefully Sorry. <laughs> I'll just cover it with a better picture or something if I just made it really shitty. I think that's it. So I've officially babbled my face off now with that. Um, and I wish you the best. I will see you next time with some ghostly story time. We're gonna, we're gonna keep it local still, fans. A lot of people know about this place, so. Um, it is privately owned, though. So I'm gonna need you to stay respectful and keep it cool, okay? Um, and it may make you crave orange sherbet. That's your clue. <laughs> it's so cute though, I love it. So yeah, you stay safe. Please be safe. Please take care. Please. I care. All right. <laughs>
I don't want to say it's handled truly disrespectfully. It's one of those like sign of the time kind of bullshit things, you know what it's, I mean? It's, it's weird because it can be very, almost like it has that Victorian kind of gothic touch, the way people talk with one another and stuff. It makes you think that it's way further back in American history. Um, when it's, you know, pretty sure it's set in the 70s. You know what I mean? At the same time, like, I feel like Janet, because what's one of the main tropes or whatever vibes about gothic literature, right? Isolation. So, and this one, she goes with that. Like, even though Isabel is like, she's off to college and the place where she lives at, you know, Aunt Camilla has people coming over all the time. Like, there's always someone around, you know what I mean? And yet there's still very much so that isolation, even when she's in class. And so she, there's still that like vibe going on. I'm hoping that she doesn't use Matthew's ethnicity as, you know, a bad thing in the end, considering that synopsis and stuff, you know? Because for right now, it seems pretty progressive. <laughs> um, so I'll let you know. With my like attention span, I tend to, I have Bookly going, like timing it, and I'll give an hour to one, and then I usually give an hour to, to another one. If I feel like reading, go for it, you know what I mean? But usually about, it's kind of like with meditation. But like, st I still at this point am sticking to like 10, maybe 15 minutes, because around the 10 minute mark, my brain is just like, you cannot control me. Uh. <laughs> So it's kind of the same way when I'm reading, even though I may be loving the book or whatever the fuck, my brain is still gonna have a point where it's like, okay, we've been sitting here for a fucking hour now, let's do something else. There's only so much time in the day, you know? Um, but like, or it doesn't. And there've been times where I've catch myself getting distracted and I get mad, <laughs> I'm like, God damn it, I just wanna read this book. So I'm, I am enjoying this one. Let me read the synopsis for you. Hidden in the depths of 18th century London, a secret apothecary shop caters to an unusual kind of clientele. Women across the city whisper of a mysterious figure named Nella, who sells well-disguised poisons to use against the oppressive men in their lives. Nella's dark world is no place for her newest patron, a precocious 12-year-old girl named Eliza Fanning. But their unexpected bond sparks a string of consequences that echoes through the centuries. 200 years later, aspiring historian Caroline Parswell discovers an aged apothecary vial in the River Thames, and she is newly grappling with this as as she is newly grappling with the searing betrayal of her husband's infidelity motherfucker. Um, a curious research project is exactly the distraction Caroline needs. Anybody else hear a certain voice in their heads when they hear the word Caroline? <laughs> but when she discovers a link between the vial and London's long unsolved apothecary murders, Caroline's upended present soon collides with an explosive history, binding her fate to Nella's and Eliza's in a stunning twist that transcends the barrier of time. Anybody else just like it? It was a stunning twist. Don't fucking tell me. Don't tell me. Like, I'll figure that out my damn self. I'm at like, what, page 104? 100 exactly. Um, I think that's a chapter break, actually. Yeah, I'm on chapter 12. Um, but yeah, 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 yeah. And then my nighttime book, the one that has replaced Honey Girl for me, is Get a Life Chloe Brown, which I was supposed to read in February, but fucking A, a day that ends with Y, um, in the sense of if we're talking about human civil rights issues, day that ends with Y, so not just February, am I right? So, um, this is... Just like Honey Girl, um, this is nice and chill. Great, like this one, I actually think that I get a little more upset with myself when my eyes, my eyelids get heavy than with Honey Girl though. 
And the only reason why I'm comparing them together is because that's that was my previous nighttime reading. So the synopsis for this, I first heard about this stuff. The reason why I went, wound up with this was because of the second book. And I was like, well, fucking A, that sounds good. I gotta read the first one. Um, this is the Brown Sisters. So here we go. Chloe Brown is a chronically ill computer geek with a goal, a plan, and a list. Fucking love a good list. After almost, but not quite, dying, she's come up with seven directives to help her get a life, and she's already completed the first, finally moving out of her glamorous family's mansion. The next items? Enjoy a drunken night out, ride a motorcycle, go camping, have meaningless but thoroughly enjoyable sex, travel the world with nothing but hand luggage. That one always, like, I mean, then you don't have to worry about it getting lost and, you know, do something bad. But it's not easy being bad, even when you've written step-by-step -step guidelines on how to do it correctly. What Chloe needs is a teacher, and she knows just the man for the job. Redford Red Morgan is a handyman with tattoos, a motorcycle, fuck yeah, and more sex appeal than 10,000 Hollywood heartthrobs. That's just dangerous. Um, he's also an artist who paints at night and hides his work in the light of day, which Chloe knows because she spies on him occasionally. Just the teeny tiniest bit. But when she enlists Fred in her mission to rebel, she learns things about him that no spy session could teach her, like why he clearly resents Chloe's wealthy background and why he never shows his art to anyone and what really lies beneath his rough exterior. Oh, oh. So much just happened. <laughs> Didn't lose my place. Did my freaking easel break? Oh my God. It has a bunch of Buffy stickers on it that I got from freaking Etsy. Do you think I want this? <laughs> 